five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. for max Q, which is maximum aerodynamic pressure. Stage one, throttle down. There's that call out for throttle down. Power and telemetry continue to be nominal for the vehicle, now traveling at 262 meters per second. Falcon 9 is supersonic. There's that call out, the Falcon 9 is supersonic, and we will be passing through max Q here shortly, the largest structural load during ascent. Max Q. There's that call out. That Falcon has passed through stage Max Q. One, one Bravo. And we've Project just entered Bravo. stage one Bravo aboard mode. That's going to take them through the end of the first stage burning just before second stage activates off the coast of North Carolina. T plus one minute and 40 seconds into flight. Dragon and Falcon 9 traveling 709 in, uh, meters per second. Started. That call that MVAC chill is underway, the Merlin vacuum engine. Now with the call out of MVAC D chilling, similar to what we saw in the first stage Merlin engines, the second stage engine being prepared for its ignition coming up in just over 30 seconds from now. We're a half a minute away from three quick events in rapid succession. We're going to get main engine cut off. The nine Merlin engines will throttle down and then shut down. We're going to get stage separation. Stage one throttle down. And then ignition of the second stage engine. If you're just joining us on CBC News Network, we have been bringing you live coverage of the SpaceX launch from Cape Canaveral, uh, Florida. It's just been an exhilarating moment, and we're able to share that moment with former Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield, who's still with us on the line. So, Chris, we just heard um, the gentleman announcing what is about to happen. I wonder if you can translate what he's saying and what we're witnessing on the screen right now. Sure, it was cool. I don't know if you were looking, but there was just this green glow just a second ago. That's right. And that's sort of like um, when you start a log in your fire and you put in one of those little starter logs. Well, to get that engine going, which burns sort of like kerosene oxygen, they have this like starter fluid that uh, that glow that burns green. So that was neat to see. You could see the green and this. So what just happened is the huge rocket that got them above the air, the the great big um, dragon, it's, it, it and it's nine engines. It has done its job. They, they're now well up above the air and that rocket is now tumbling back to earth and hopefully they'll be able to land it on a barge and use it again. And now the crew is being pushed by just one of these engines and it's burning uh, sort of like kerosene, a, a kind of a refined kerosene and, and oxygen. And that's the engine now that'll burn for another six minutes or so maybe a little less now, to get them uh, fast enough to stay in orbit. They have to get going eight kilometers a second. You know, that's uh, 28,000 kilometers an hour. It's 25 times the speed of sound. If you can get going that fast, then you can just coast in orbit. And that's what that engine's doing now. Most of the dangerous hard stuff is done. They had a successful light at, on the pad. They made it through the atmosphere. The first stage came away and the second engine lit. So th those are those are a lot of the big, uh, the big hurdles to get over. Now, so long as this engine keeps running, touch wood, uh, they'll be able to get up to orbit. Then they'll bring their spaceship to life and start working their way up towards docking with the space station. But, but so far, uh, four and a half minutes in, about halfway through their, their launch rocket cycle. So far, so good. 
Well, we're very glad to hear that. You know, my my heart sank, my stomach got all tight when it just went black for a second before the explosion and, and the rocket actually taking off. And then we heard the voice of the announcer saying, not even gravity can contain humanity. And such a beautiful, poetic way of capturing. This is really inspiring stuff. What what humanity has been able to accomplish and, and to go beyond our tiny, beautiful green and blue marble hanging in the heavens. You know, what for those who may not be as compelled by what is happening right now, um, what's your argument? Why, why should we care? Why, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of an economic collapse, why is this still so important, Chris? Well, well, more reasons than you can imagine. Uh, number one, um, we count on space to a tremendous degree every single day. Our ability to communicate with each other, to navigate, to understand the weather, to, to, you know, to be able to get internet to the whole world. That's all either already working for us from space or just on the verge of that happening. And none of it happens accidentally. It happens because we push the edges. At the same time, uh, we have to inspire our kids. I have a, a granddaughter who's just starting kindergarten. We have to show them a different future with, with greater options than the ones that we had. That's what drives us and pushes us to not only explore, but, but to invent and to create. If you look at Elon Musk, and this rocket wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Elon. He was just a little kid growing up in South Africa, but he was inspired by the space program. All the work that he's done in, in battery technology, in electric cars, in, um, in rocket companies, in uh, all the other fascinating projects he's working on, it's because we showed him the edge of a future that didn't exist. It inspired him to, I mean, he went to Queens University in Kingston. It inspired him to, to pursue a different life. And that's a big part of it as well. And, and the last part is just understanding our world. It's really hard to understand the world from, I don't know, Toronto or, or uh, I don't know, choose any city in the world. You have to see the whole world to truly get a global understanding of what the state is and what changes are and, and what, what has an impact on what. And our global observation satellites, the International Space Station that's been looking at and recording the health of the world for over 20 years, that is also the, the daughter of, of the space program. So, you know, I, I mean, it's always easy to throw up your hands and say, we got serious problems, we shouldn't worry about the future. But it's never the right answer.